Thank you. Um, it's an honor to be here, and James, thank you for the, the kind words. Um, as you know, those of you who've heard me um, speak before know that this will not be a, totally a serious talk. Um, so I hope you'll enjoy the talk. I'm going to try to weave in a little bit of the history of this, some of the applications, what we're doing now, and what some of this uh, may mean. First, um, of course, it's an honor to receive the, the Goldschmidt Medal, um, and I'm deeply grateful. Uh, this is a picture I found on the web of Goldschmidt speaking with Albert Einstein. I couldn't find the year on it, but I thought it's a great picture. It's supposed to be a lake in Switzerland. I'm not sure if that's true. If it's not true, um, it's a good story. Now, first thing, before I start, I want to clear up something that I've heard said, and I have to get this absolutely straight. I've been accused of people working in my laboratory that hair loss is associated with it. <laughs> now, the thing is, here's a picture of James as a youngster who you've just heard do the, and I just want you to know that this was well on the way to happening before he came to work with me. So whatever he says, um, it's, it's, a, it's blatantly untrue. So those of us, most half of this audience, if not more, measure isotopes. And the birthday of isotope effects is 1947. It's very clear. And three things happened. One was this paper by Harold Urey where it described how the forensics of isotope effects work. Secondly, a paper by Jake Big Eliason and Maria Mayer, also at Chicago on the same floor in the building, in fact, and which was the same floor where I eventually worked. Um, in Chicago that did the same thing, and Al Near made a paper that described the first isotope ratio mass spectrometer, that you could actually measure these effects, and poof, this was the paleo-oceanography, paleo-igneous thermometry, and the whole field of mass-dependent isotope effects was born in 1947. And half of my measurements were made in this building named after Harold Urey, and here's the foraminifera, and here's the deuterium hydrogen signal um, that led to his discovery of the Nobel Prize. Here's Harold Urey, and this is Urey Hall. Now, this is a very good thing, actually, having a building named after you, because then you don't have to memorize the name of the building. Say, oh, yeah, it's Farquhar Hall. Okay, that's good. It's named after me. So this is Urey, and this is Urey Hall, where half of our measurements were made. The first measurements were made, actually, in Mayer Hall, named after Maria Mayer, who was one of the co-authors on the first papers. Um, now, all of you know this, and you've heard it in a few talks, traditional isotope effects all have variations that go from translation, rotation, vibration, and those were those laws of forensics that Yuri invented, um, and, and Jake Big Eliasson and Maria Mayer. Uh, the nuclear one James mentioned, I won't talk about it, small, the hyperfine-induced hyper chemical nuclear polarization effects are known, but not relevant for what we'll be talking about today. Now, all of these in electronics we, uh, are, are of, of importance. All of them, in some way, reduce to something dependent on mass. So isotope ratios change on the basis of mass. And so this is, so if you don't know this, this is the one thing you have to pay attention to. I know you're all sleepy, you're jet lagged, you had lunch and not enough coffee. But here's the oxygen 17 over 16, and here's the oxygen 18 over 16. And you go around the solar system, you measure it in water and rain and sedimentary rocks and lunar rocks are here and air oxygen's here. And they lie on the slope of one half line because the moon and the planets are made of one pot of oxygen and you distribute it by kinetics, thermodynamics, gravity, diffusion, evaporation, condensation. They all depend on mass. And the mass difference here is one, mass difference here is two. And so you slide up and down the line. And this, this mysterious term here of the capital delta is any deviation from this line. That's the background. So this is where it comes in in 1983 when I wrote this paper. For those of you doing the mathematics, when I wrote the paper in 1983, I was six years old. <laughs> so in 1973, my postdoctoral mentor um, at the University of Chicago, Bob Clayton, wrote this paper that you all know, same coordinate system, here's the slope of one half, and he discovered in these calcium aluminum inclusions a meteorite with a slope of one. This had never been seen before. The first violation of the Urey, Big Eliason, Mayer, Harmon, Craig rules 
that had ever been observed. And so if you read this paper, which most of you probably had, he said there's only two ways you can get a slope of one. You can operate on pure oxygen 16, or you can do 17 and 18 equally and change it. And he argued, for, secondly, that it can't be a chemical process because all the rules known to mankind, womankind, and certain species of animals is that all these effects depend on mass. And so this has to be a nuclear effect. And since there's no way that you can do things by nuclear where you do 17 and 18, this has to be a supernova and pure oxygen 16. Now I first, so my part in this starts around 1970 something and as a graduate student and hearing about this. And I remember where I was sitting at the table when I heard the story and thinking, wow, what a great story. But this is a really big assumption that there's no chemical way that you can get off of this line. It's never been tested. And so it got to be 1980 and it hadn't been tested. And the only person that I remember who really had the foresight to start testing it, where is he? Gustav Arrhenius here, um, started questioning this, that is there a chemical way to do this? And he wrote a series of papers and, and publications and abstracts at Houston thinking about chemical ways to do this. And he was dead on right to do this. And he had some really interesting ideas and he was actually very encouraging to me to, to pursue this, this goofy line. So in the Jeep, as James, when I drove from Chicago to La Jolla, knowing that I wouldn't have much to work on this, I designed the first experiments. And these you've probably seen too. You start with oxygen, you make ozone, and here's the residual oxygen, and the slope of the line is exactly one, exactly the same as the meteorite line. This is fundamental. The slope of one is fundamental, and there's a reason for it. And so this is clearly, so this is, this is one example where you're at least sure that the assumption's wrong. This is a chemical process. Early on, John Heidenreich and I ruled out supernova debris in these experiments. Our lab is messy, but it's not that bad. This is the mass spectrometer where the first 10,000 measurements were made. This is the cobblestone of mass spectrometers. This is the oldest one in existence now. This was Harold Urey's machine that he brought from the University of Chicago to La Jolla when he came. And so my, I inherited this machine. I was hired as a replacement for Hans Seuss, took over Harold Urey's old laboratory, and this was the machine. Now, those, this is a copper tube. For those of you, I hope the Finnegan people aren't here because they'll have a heart attack to see how they did it, is that you were focused on here and you couldn't steer the optics. So there was a turnbuckle here that you basically, you bent the flight tube to line it up. And it's a very touchy uh, operation. This is the original magnet. This was made in the, in the laboratory at the Fermi Institute. And then after this one was made, they made three more for Harmon Craig, Bob Clayton, and Cesare Emiliani. Um, and so I rebuilt this to make those measurements. And so we explained it in that paper, trying to understand how do you come up with it. And we, in the paper that John Heidenreich and I wrote in 1983, we suggest that it's isotopic self-shielding um, in carbon monoxide, and that would explain it in the O2, and it would be relevant for explaining the meteorites by isotopic self-shielding of carbon monoxide. We said it here, it's, it's recently been discovered uh, 19 years later. Um, I should say in 1985, Jerry Wasserberg did what I regard as, as an ultimate act of gentlemanship or gentlemanship or whatever it should be, is he came down to, 19, to visit me for a day to point out that kinetically there's a problem with self-shielding, that when you just shield and you make an atom, the exchange process erases in those experiments the original isotope effect. But rather than write a, secretly write a reply or a letter and let it appear, he came down to talk to me about it and say, Mark, you know, Oded and Navan and I came up with a better explanation. And I remember he called me up and said he was going to come down and spend the day with me. And I had to teach, I was teaching physical chemistry in a, and I had to give a lecture on quantum mechanics. And I told John Heidenreich, Jerry Wasserberg, this famous gentleman, Goldschmidt medalist and everything else known to geochemistry is coming down. And you've read all these papers. Now I'm going to be gone. When Professor Wasserberg comes, you must tell him to come in here and show him where to get because the building's a little goofy. And I came and said, John, where's Wasserberg? He said, I don't know. And I said, there's just this old guy running around in frumpy pants wearing a blue baseball cap with orange wings sticking out of the side. I said, that's him. 
and lo and behold, it was Jerry Wasserberg. And so, uh, so the self-shielding didn't work, and, and so we needed a new enterprise to go in this, and my son Max has pointed out to me that new enterprises, you have to be careful, because if you get the wrong enterprise, then you end up in Romulan space, and it's terrible, and you have to do other things. So moving on to a different explanation, here's a fundamental part that we're going to come back to, and you'll hear a lot, and it's the role of symmetry. Oxygen isotopes, hydrogen isotopes were discovered the same way and it's the property of symmetry, and it's rotational symmetry. If you take a molecule, blue or 16 oxygen, 16, 16, 16, here's the energy states, here's the vibrational states, here's the rotational states. Now you substitute it. And if you rotate this guy over to here, it's a different molecule, because the red one's here, and, it, and the same is true for oxygen 18. So the alternate rotational lines appear. That's, what do, that's how Urey discovered deuterium, which I showed you on the plaque, and that's how Jonc in Berkeley discovered oxygen isotopes, was looking at these ultra lines. Symmetry is important, but it's important in the ozone experiment in a really difficult way, and I'm going to flash through it, and James said it right, it's really complicated. Rudy Marcus, who has a Nobel Prize in chemistry and is, is no slouch at discovering these things, understanding these things, what happens when an atom and a molecule come together? Q means a heavy isotope. They form an excited state, because they're coming through at the speed of sound, and they have a lot of energy, and they're weakly bonded, but not stably bonded. In fact, a million will dissociate back again, and one stabilizes. The rules of stabilization depends on how long they stay in the gray zone here. If they stay longer, they stabilize better. And so in the case of the symmetric ones, they fall apart at a given rate, but the asymmetric ones have more states. They have more way to spread energy, and they have more ways to stabilize. So the stabilization energy goes with symmetry, not the mass. So it's the symmetry that's important, and it answers a very important question, is what's special about oxygen? And that's a major feature. It's not the only, but it's major. Conrad Malzberger, in, in Heidelberg, and, 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 and in part when he was at Minnesota, made some beautiful measurements. These are the enrichments in, in percent, so this is 100 per mil. So 17, here's the purely symmetric ones, using labeled oxygen, and you can see the asymmetric molecules have faster rates. And in comparison on here, the blue ones are, are sorry, this one, green is experiment, and red is Rudy's model, Rudy Marcus's model. And so they do a pretty good job. It's not perfect, but the role of symmetry is fundamental here. And this isn't a lecture in chemical physics, but, but this is a major ongoing research topic in the world of theoretical and, and, and experimental chemical physics. And I've been lucky to have people in my laboratory, and still do, whose background is really in quantum chemistry, along with people like, like James, well, sort of like James, and that do geochemistry and paleo work and, and whatnot. So I'm going to talk. I'm going to go through some applications that got us started in this because uh, when we started, um, you know, we didn't know if this would appear in nature and it was a curiosity. Would it explain the meteorites? So some of the things we did is to study what happens in the outer part of the atmosphere, and this really doesn't show the outer part of the atmosphere, but I like the picture, so I thought I'd show it. And if you went to the the lecture after John Eiler's talk on clumped isotopes, he was. Talking, they were talking about the CO2 isotope anomalies that occur here. And the upper atmosphere oxidation process is controlled by atomic oxygen, and atomic oxygen only has 1,000 per cc's, which means you can't measure it. It's too low, but it's the most important species in the whole upper atmosphere. So if you can measure anything, if you ask any atmospheric chemistry, you stop them outside of Trader Joe's and says, what could you measure? And you put them up against the wall and say, atomic oxygen. But they can't. But if you could find a proxy for it, then it's fat city. Then you can learn things and learn a lot of new things. But you have to go along up in here where all the action is from here to here. Now, balloons go up to here, and that's great. But balloons, we, we flew balloons for a while, and I hate flying balloons. They take forever. You have to go to Palestine, Texas. They're expensive and slow. And they only go to here, and their success rate up here is about 50%. So if you want to go higher, you have to do this. So here's our experiment. Some of you have seen this before, and we're back in this business again. It's a two-stage rocket, Nike Orion to do the short ones. 
Terrier black brands for the higher ones. It's a classical stuff with a 3.8 second Nike Orion burn. Here's um, a rendition of me. This is in the vehicle assembly building at the White Sands Missile Range, putting it together. This is Jeff Johnson, who has now turned white. Um, uh, Jerry Wasserberg, in fact, asked him if, if it was my fault, and, and Jeff told him yes, but it was a lie. And it, who measured tropospheric ozone for the isotope effects, which Conrad Mausberger and Dieter Kranikowski have done also in, in their hard measurements. This is Steve Cliff, who was the first one to um, measure the oxygen, mass independent oxygen in nitrous oxide. And so this is putting together the payload for the sampling. Um, this is what it looks like. This is the, this is the terrier, the black branch back here. He's taking a picture to make sure he's taking the bolt. Um, looking to make sure it goes right because if it blows up, it's my fault and, and then funding gets to be problematic. If you ever want to look at a fully loaded, fully lined rocket missile system, this is what it looks like pointed at you. And, and the photographer, in fact, is my little baby daughter who is sitting in the front row here who took this and then we both quickly left this because then it's time to launch. And then it goes up and it's a very fast experiment. It samples oxygen, it freezes in three samples, comes back. Uh, frozen a liquid helium, we extract it out, take it back to La Jolla, separate all the species, measure the isotopes, and that's all it takes. And what we find then is that the CO2 has a mass independent composition. And here's the sum total from us and Becky Alexander, who measured them from balloon flights, and, and the group in Germany and Conrad Mausberg, or Carl Brennick Meyer's group, and you can see it's a beautiful straight line fit with a slope of 1.7 rather than one half, largely mass dependent. And the reason in part, and this is a mystery now, is that it comes from atomic oxygen from ozone photolysis that exchanges with carbon dioxide and puts it in the carbon dioxide. So what this is measuring is the exposure to O singlet D, the most important part of the upper stratosphere. So number one, that's an important way to follow the ozone cycle. Number two, it's a stratosphere-troposphere mixing. And Christy Boring at Berkeley is doing this work now using ER2 aircraft, and there was a talk on the, on the polar vortices um, earlier this morning. And she's done work with Nobel laureate Yuan Li using molecular beam experiments to try to really understand the mechanism of this transfer, because there's some very interesting stochastic processes, but also some quantum chemistry going on that needs to be known. But this has really been a breakthrough in trying to understand the upper stratosphere. Um, now, for those of us who don't know how to do things, this is the low-tech approach to doing PowerPoint. And so here's molecular oxygen. Molecular oxygen is constant to within a few hundredths of a per mil in the troposphere. But as you get into the stratosphere, in the mesosphere, and the thermosphere, you can see that the oxygen isotope enrichment goes to 40 per mil. This is a huge isotope effect in the most, second most abundant molecule in the atmosphere, and we don't know why. And so the next step is to measure the nitrogen and hopefully the carbon dioxide, but you only get about a tenth of a micromole of carbon dioxide, which now we can analyze. And so the next step is, as they say in the Blues Brothers, to put the band back together again and go back and finish these measurements. So that's part of it. This is um, rocket science jokes. So now for something completely different. One of the interesting parts of this ozone is ozone has this tag. It's like a fluorescent tag, this mass independence. Once you see it, you've got ozone. And the oxidation reactions of SO2 and NO2 to sulfate and nitrate carry a signature of ozone, because you can get oxidized by ozone, hydrogen, peroxide, and OH. And this is fundamentally important. OH, for measurements in theory, is purely mass dependent. So if you measure sulfate and nitrate, and it has a mass independent signature, it's a measure of ozone. And so first, in atmospheric chemistry, knowing how much goes by a homogeneous, meaning pure gas phase, or liquid phase, which are these guys, is critical. For climate warming, condensation nuclei forming, um, changes in the atmosphere related to that, you have to know that. But there's no one measure that gives you that. But we know all the rate constants, 
and people know it, I don't measure rate constants, but they're all known. And we know the isotopic composition of this, we know the isotopic composition of this, we know the isotopic composition of the water, and we've done the fundamental physical chemistry to measure the fractionation factors and the oxidation. So when you measure the sulfate and nitrate, you can back out of that, first, how much came from liquid versus gas, which is a big deal in atmospheric chemistry. But secondly, you get the ozone concentration. You say, well, so what, Mark? On the internet, I can go and look up the ozone concentration. Who cares? Or for 4,000 bucks, I can buy an orange box that measures ozone concentration. The big deal is that you can measure it in the past, which Becky Alexander did in her thesis work at, she's now on the faculty at the University of Washington. And Joel Savarino, when he came to work with us in, in La Jolla, got us into this ridiculous world of ice cores. Sorry, Martin, I see him sitting up in the front row. This is it. But parts of it has some problems with it. Um, so here's the temperature change through the Holocene. You get it from deuterium isotopes and oxygen isotopes. Everyone knows this. So here you are, here it's cold, it's 20,000 20, years ago, it's the ice age. All right, it's cold, it's warming up, and here we are, and here we are way back at 120,000 years ago, and it's warming. Here's the mass independent oxygen composition with time, plotted on the same axis of the sulfate. Nitrate does exactly the same thing. But here's the thing. You're thinking, all right, so you've got another measure of temperature. And the answer is, no, it's not, mm -hmm. but thanks for playing. Um, what it's measuring is the rate of homogeneous gas phase versus liquid phase. When it's in the gas phase, it's purely mass dependent because it's OH plus SO2 or OH plus NO2. And that means the capital delta is zero. So when it's colder in the ice ages, there's not as much liquid water. So it's an oxidation in a gas phase. But when it's warmer, there's more liquid water and it goes through the solution. And so what you're following here is a change in both the oxidation capacity and the mechanism. And this is one of those things that in a paleo atmosphere is you really want to know, but there's nothing otherwise to measure. And so for the first time, you can start getting at things like the ozone capacity of the Earth, as well as the liquid versus um, uh, gas phase temperature. And then here we've gone and looked at it through past, and you can see this is just looking at the different pathways versus time uh, from Becky's work. You can also see it's interesting if you look at the soot index, this is from Joelle's work, and now this is in Greenland, and you see the capital delta is sulfate. You're able to model in the Greenland ice core what happens here during the Industrial Revolution. What happens in the Greenland ice core is if you look at the, and you model this data, what you find is that all of the pollution coming into Greenland is not from industry. 30% that you get out of the isotope work, in fact, comes from um, biomass burning. The United States is growing, we're getting a lot of industry, but you need more food. And John Deere hasn't invented the, the tractor yet, so what do we do? You burn the fields, and that's what you're seeing here and then it goes away with time. So we're using this to track atmospheric chemistry, but also the movement of masses over different parts of the planet. One of the other parts that comes out of the ice core is a sensitivity analysis of perturbations of the stratosphere. And I think this one's LG Chan. When you had the very massive stratospheric injections and pretend that the ceiling up here is the stratosphere, that the SO2 gas gets into the stratosphere or sulfur oxide species get into the stratosphere and move towards the pole, mass independent photolysis experiments, part of which was actually discovered by James, um, occurs so that when it deposits in the pole, you can see the change in the mass independent composition as the plumes move to the south pole or to the north pole. So what we're seeing is a change in the stratospheric chemistry by the additions of natural pollutants. So it gives us a way to predict what natural normal pollution does so we can calculate what our effect is going to be. So part of it is trying to understand what happens in, in ice cores. Now what we really wanted to understand, and Joel Savarino when he came to work with me, got me in this ridiculous world um, of looking at climate change, but we decided we wanted to look at it at a very high resolution, meaning six months at a time going back hundreds of years. And to do that you need a very 
uh, nice, straight deposition rate, which means you have to go here, South Pole. 10,000 feet, composition rate, it doesn't change over time. It's very nice, it's clean, and it's a miserable place. And so this is how you get your graduate students to go. This was somebody who you all know, was, was Ernest Shackleton. You know, it's basically when he wrote this in, in, in London, when he got people to go there, and, and the slip where um, Ernest Shackleton's boat was tied up, there's still a monument there for it. And, 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 and in fact, uh, Nina Sharp took me to see this, and, and the Shackleton exhibit, our place is still there, and it's very nice. So this is how you get people to go. So this is the working place where you spend four or five weeks. It looks the same in all directions. And here's what you do. You can't take ice cores. For three months at a time, you gotta take a big slab. And so this is going back in time. And here's Joel in his fine surgical garb taking a three centimeter slab. And you have to go back and do it. And here I am, I'm sure you can recognize me at the bottom of this stinking snow pit. Uh, it takes about 30 tons of snow to get your samples here. Um, so those of you who like field work, if you want to go here, it's really interesting for 7.5 minutes. <laughs> so if you analyze a sulfate and nitrate, and this is a result of Joelle's work and one of my graduate students, um, uh, Justin McCabe, and if you, get, if you need to take a graduate student to go here, the most important quality is size. You want a big graduate student because if you want to dig that much snow, it's bad. If you take the mass independent signature and you do a Fourier transform on, on it, what you find is that you can see the natural variations. And here's the, here's the quasi biannual oscillation. Here's ozone. Here's the mass independent signal. Here's ozone at, at four years peaking over the past 100 years. And here it is at about 11 years, the sunspot cycle. So the ozone and the mass independent signal follow each other, but it's not for certain why the QBO and the 11-year sunspot cycle is there. And so these three peaks are the subject of, of six different papers and works to understand why this is going. But you can see the signal is preserved in the ice, and that gives us a way to go in and understand. Now the next part of this is, of course, to do the same thing in the northern hemisphere. So a couple years ago, we went for five weeks to the Greenland summit, which is actually worse than the South Pole here, because it's a little higher and more isolated, and we did the same stupid thing there. And we're in the process of analyzing that. We've just finished the volcanic measurements. Um, uh, Allison and Jahan Koldai, who are from San, uh, South Dakota State University, have been involved in, in making these measurements, and it's, and it's actually quite interesting. That, should appear before long. So we went and did the same thing here and it's to see how the northern hemisphere is. And when I got the opportunity to go and do this in Greenland, I can't really explain how happy I was. So this picture pretty much summarizes it. it was, so this is sort of the end of the atmospheric part, but I want to make a point here is that sulfate, nitrate, nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide, O2, and Boaz Luz, who's our Patterson Award winner this year, has made these masterpieces measurements to show that even molecular oxygen is mass independent. The second most abundant element in the atmosphere is not on the line. Nitrate, ozone, stratospheric, tropospheric, CO2 you've heard about. We Ming Bao, who worked with, with me, has done some really great work on perchlorate and showed that it's also off the line. And so I show this, the only one that's sort of on the line, and Martin Miller, when he's not making a living, making up uh, fake words for avian nomenclature, um, is working on water in high resolution for delta 17 and 18. Um, so every oxygen species in the atmosphere is mass independent. I say this because I remember seeing an a paper article in in the Los Angeles time with a quote from Bob Clayton that said that the ozone effect is very interesting, but it's not going to be observed in nature. So getting to the meteorites, a little bit of this work is a little, this is a Picasso painting of, of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. Panza is a little bit like tilting at windmills because it's a lot of doctrine that one has to deal with. And so one of which is this issue of self-shielding. And the problem with this, I better keep an eye on my time, is that you have to test it. And the idea 
when we wrote the paper in, in 83 and, and then Bob Clayton rediscovered in, nine, in 2002, is that you have more UV in the Titari stage of the sun. It's in the short UV region where CO absorbs, and it has isotope lines that are specific that allows different isotopes to dissociate at different rates. And so the problem, and, and of course, then it, the absorption goes with the abundance of 16, 18, and 17. And that gives you, as we said in, in, in the 83 paper, a slope one by definition. If you do something on the basis of the nucleic abundances, it gives you a slope one. So it fits very nicely. And, and 16 goes first, and then, and then you come back and you get 17 and 18. I once gave a talk with two laser pointers, but, but we're using two laser pointers. I, then a small aircraft taxied into the auditorium. So you should never do this without proper training. Um, but no one's ever tested this. Because there's a big assumption in a self-shielding is that there's no other affected self-shielding. But the problem is that if you do it here or you do it out here, that part of the UV spectrum is less than 100, is around 105 nanometers and shorter. And the problem with doing that is that you need the light. And the only way to get really enough light to make enough to measure is you need a synchrotron. So we got that. And here's the spectrum, which is down in here in the electromagnetic spectra. And so we went to the Republic of Berkeley and set up our apparatus in the advanced light source. So number one, it's important because it's Berkeley and it's California. Number two, this is where the film Incredible Hulk number one was made, was in this light source here. So if you get it when he destroys a laboratory, it was actually here. They put it back together especially for us to make the measurements. Subrata so Chakraborty did these experiments, and these are by far the hardest experiments we've ever done. Harder than the rockets, certainly harder than digging a stinking snow pit. And the problem is that all material dis absorbs light below 105 nanometers. It means you can't use a window, or you won't get the light into your experiment. So all you have to do is shine your light in and have three pages where you have carbon monoxide put into each of these so that when you get back in here, so you have a column of CO to dissociate it at the right wavelength so that you don't have any window, but you can't let it go back in the synchrotron or you'll shut it down and then collect the carbon dioxide that's made after dissociation here. And with an eight hour of radiation, you get a half a micromole of sample that you have to take back and fluorinate to convert to O2 to measure. And then change the wavelengths and do this. This is really a hard experiment, which he did. And there was a little graphic. And here's what you find is at two different wavelengths, you get a slope, 107, 105, you get a slope of about a 1.16 or 1.2 in the product. There's an effect in O plus CO, but look at the scale of the isotope effect, 3,000 per mil. This is a huge effect. I, there's probably bigger effects, but I don't know of them. So this is a huge effect, and this is the slope. And the problem is the slope that you want to get is one. Remember, the meteorites are one. Shielding predicts one. You don't get it, and you don't get it at different wavelengths. So that's point one. Point two, and this is the observation. So is, that's, these are just the measurements, and you can see they're clean. I mean, for what it takes to do these stinking experiments, these are clean measurements. And we measure the yield. How many photons go in, and how much product you make? And the answer is, it's about at the percent level. Most of the photons don't dissociate. And the reason is well known. Here's what happens. You absorb a light, and you go up to here. And that process has, has been worked out by Max Born early on. And, and the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, Born won the Nobel Prize for part of this work, is to excite to this excited state. It goes to the excited state by the quantum mechanical absorption. Then it goes on to this state depending on its, its um, levels here. That was worked out in part by James Franck in Göttingen, who won the Nobel Prize for that work. And the Frank Condon factors deal with how, work, how well this works. Then you have to go from here, from red to green. And that's inter system crossing. Part of that was worked out by people like Dudley Hirschbach, who won the Nobel Prize for that work. And then it dissociates, which has been measured in iodine in real time by, sub, by femtosecond and picosecond uh, laser techniques by Ahmed Zawail at Caltech, who won the Nobel Prize for that, where you actually measure this process. So this process is really well known. There's four Nobel Prize 
tied up in this. And what it says is this is very selective. And to get from here to here, there's a lot of traffic congestion. And it's here. So crossing this curve is, is where the big action is, in, in my opinion, and, and, and much better people than me. So what, is, what I think is probably happening, and obviously there's more experiments that need to be done, is the shielding works down here, but then all the violence is going through here. So what I think we're probing with this is actually for the first time at the isotope level, what happens here. And so if you then plot, here's the meteorite line, here's what you need from self-shielding, and here's what we measure. They're not the same. So there's a lot more that needs to be done, but the question is what's going on with these meteorites? And this is the perfect conference to, to sort of begin to work my way towards the end. It's oxygen. Remember I said symmetry is fundamental. If you play this game, what can I find on the periodic chart and think about where I can make an a molecule where on the end is going to be a two atoms that are the same, has more than two stable isotopes, occurs in the gas phase and leads to a solid. Well, hydrogen maybe, no, can't do anything. Noble gases, boring, nothing. Um, these guys and all the rest of the periodic chart is coordinated by oxygen. Oxygen's always on the end. So the only molecule, with the exception of sulfur, that might show a symmetry dependence is oxygen. And everyone in this room knows that if you want to make a planet, what are planets made out of, class? They're made out of oxygen. So that's the key factor here. So no matter what you want to do, whether you want to shield, you want to do CO photochemistry, you still have to make a rock. And you still have to go from that gas phase molecule to some stable species that leads to a silicate. Man, you've got to make a silicate. And that symmetry law still pertains here. We've measured others' reactions in O plus CO and other and sulfur reactions that show the symmetry dependence works and it doesn't care who's in the middle. So you have to make a silicate. So no matter what, you have to do this. And in this reaction, according to what we know, that it's the quantum mechanics of the symmetry reactions that's fundamental and it's the oxygen and its position on a periodic chart, in short, the geochemistry. So that's that part of it. It's just, it takes time to, to change people's opinion and this is a little bit what it's like with trying to change people's mind. This is the, the back end of an elephant. Uh, in case, you, for those of you, not everyone's a biologist, so I sometimes have to explain these things. So I'm gonna finish, because I have to talk about sulfur and this is a good time that I can acknowledge uh, my wife because Every time I went to the grocery store, if I sometimes I'd be asked to bring home a quart of milk, I would come home with a small pony or something like that. And so my memory sometimes isn't good, and so I was sort of um, left with the opinion, of, well, you're only good for oxygen isotopes. So I had to prove my worth of being good at something else, and so I started measuring sulfur isotopes. Ponies still come home, but so anyway. I have to give credit that I've learned these stable isotopes of sulfur, and it has four of them, which makes them interesting geochemically. And so he, James, when he asked to come to San Diego, he's interested in carbonates in Mars. And if you can understand, since we know atmospheric CO2 is anomalous, Mars probably is too, and you have an oxidation to make carbonates, then that might be a way to study carbonates and water on Mars. And somebody knows we're probably where this is going. So this is courtesy of Lily Thiemens. This is water on Mars, and she told me to tell you this, this is only a working model, so don't take this seriously. We're working out the details on the rest of the water on Mars. But anyway, this is, this is very valuable, and you may have seen this before. So James found that oxygen in, in carbonates on Mars is, in fact, mass independent. It was really a nice experiment that he did and, and, and published. And that's a new way to look at water regolith and study water on Mars and to go beyond Lily's photograph. But he also decided to measure sulfate and found that in NACLA, which is a Martian meteorite, there's a small mass independent isotope effect. And we decided what to do. That's where we started looking at mass independent effects in photolysis because we've done it for 20 years and other things. So on Mars, it may be important with SO2 at UV, and that's why we did it. Now, those of you who are might not meteorite people, I see a few of you out here, already know the story about NACLA. Now, NACLA is the only meteorite that has killed a dog. 
and this is actually the poor Nakba dog who was in Egypt. It's an artist's rendition. Now you're asking yourself, why did it kill a dog out of all the places? Why couldn't it kill a stinking camel? But instead, no, it kills a dog, but that's life in a food chain. So James investigated the different wavelengths, and, and even though people gripe about it, we do it at 193 and 220 nanometers, and you do it with broadband, you still see the mass independent effect in the photolysis. And that led James to talk, start thinking about what if there was no oxygen and ozone in the atmosphere? Could you get the mass independent effect in SO2 in the Precambrian? And then in fact, that would give you some measure of the amount of oxygen and ozone in the atmosphere. And you know, of course, you've seen this figure that, in the paper, is that you can see in the old rocks, both the oxidized and reduced species have positive and negative sulfur anomalies that disappear around here. There are some sulfur mass independent effects in tiny reservoirs, like in the volcano debris that gets into the stratosphere, but that's about it. So this has turned out to be a whole enormous, interesting group of studies to be done um, that, that James really led the way in, and there's a lot of people working in. So that a lot of you know about, and there was a number of talks yesterday, and there's more in the rest of this. And of course, that's led to trying to place limits on how much oxygen and ozone is in the atmosphere. And this is a, a really interesting area that's developed because of it. So this is, a, this is my last slide. It's a painting by Aronimus Bosch of his picture of, of the universe. It's not the scale for those of you who are wondering. So you can tell that over the years of doing these things, uh, people ask me, um, what are you? Are you a chemist or a physicist or a climate person, a meteorite person? And the answer is probably none of them, really. But it's just sort of a fun world with this, the, this fundamental um, physical chemistry and how it applies in nature and understanding physical chemistry and how that it works. And I've been lucky to have a lot of people, all the way from John Heidenreich, who was my first student, even though he couldn't identify Jerry Wasserberg, um, it was a great student, James. Sui Ming Bao was working here. Kuni Nishizumi was down the hall, and he's only been a, 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 a rogue in my side here. But um, a lot of people have, have, have been coming, uh, work with me, Joel Savarino, Becky Alexander, um, um, have all come and worked with me over the years. And it's made a big difference. And finally, the last thing I'll say is that uh, you spend a lot of time, those of you who go in the field, you know what it means when you go to a, a mountain, a ship, or ice, or some stupid place like that, or fly things. It means you have to spend a lot of time away. You spend a lot of time in your lab. Things don't work. So um, thanks to my family, uh, my daughter, my son, Nina, Emma, thank you. So thank you all for everything. And I know you got to get to the next talk.